Now we'll go live with Congressman Cole and a few words about the latest in Washington and in the 4th District. Congressman? Melissa, thank you very much. And for those of you on the call, thank you so much for taking the time on uh, what I'm sure is a busy uh, time for for all of us. And um, uh, again, I appreciate it very much. Uh, Let me talk a little bit about what's happening in Washington first, and then a little bit about uh, uh, some of the events that are going on outside of Washington, but certainly are roiling the political world, if you will. Uh, First, it's actually been a pretty legislatively active time uh, in uh, August, which is usually a downtime, but late July and August. And there's three big items, two of which I favored, actually worked across the aisle on, one of which I certainly did not. Uh, you know, Congress passed recently the so-called Burns Pits or PACT legislation. This is about making sure that veterans uh, that were exposed, usually in combat situations, to uh, burn pits, that is, places where potentially hazardous waste is disposed and they've contracted uh, health issues before. We have not covered that traditionally in VA programs. The bill that was passed was certainly not perfect, but look, I think in the end of the day, when men and women put their life on the line for you uh, and suffer some damage, the United States government needs to step up. So I certainly supported that legislation. Uh, it passed in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, the president signed it and uh, uh, we're certainly going to monitor it, try and make sure that people are taken care of. But I think it was the right thing to do, and proud to have worked uh, that it was with friends on both sides of the aisle to get that done. The second item which we passed is the so-called Chips and Science Bill, or Chips Plus Bill. And Chips refers to computer chips, uh, and uh, the science part sort of got left out in the discussion, although it's really the bigger part of the bill. Let me talk a little bit about why I supported that legislation. Um, uh, uh, About 20 years ago, the United States made roughly 40% of all the semiconductor computer chips in the world. We're now down to 12. Uh, And what we make is mostly comparatively low grade. We don't make the highest uh, quality computer chips. Those are actually mostly made in Taiwan, which actually has 90% of the market. And to give you an idea how important that is to us, uh, those of you that follow uh, the the situation in Ukraine have heard a lot about the American weapons system, the Javelin, which uh, is a a anti-tank missile that's been extraordinarily successful in taking out Russian armored vehicles. Uh, Javelin has about, well, let me just not be too specific. Let me just say it has many dozens of chips in it. Most of those are, almost none of them are made in the United States anymore. They're all made overseas. So if something ever happened to disrupt that supply, we would be in very difficult shape. So the CHIPS portion of this bill was a combination of grants and uh, tax subsidies, that that is uh, tax breaks, to get people to construct more CHIPS manufacturing in the United States. Intel, for interest, is putting in a $20 billion facility. That's with a B. Uh, in Ohio. We also have Micron and actually some Taiwanese companies coming into both Arcan- or, excuse me, Arizona and New York. Uh, so this is a big deal. This is bringing production back into the United States. Um, I think that's clearly the right thing to do. Uh, we saw during COVID, for instance, when some of the pharmaceutical products we na- needed were made in China, Uh, the things became very difficult to get. We just simply can't be in that position, and certainly that was something as important as computer chips. The other portion of the bill actually had to do with just the normal funding, although with some increases and some reforms in our science programs, NASA, National Science Foundation. This is simply to to, uh, uh, finance uh, high-level research so that we always are are, you know, designing the best chips in the world. Again, our problem has been production, not design. We, we're awfully good at making a high-quality product. This would keep us there. And uh, that money, which you know, this was a $280 billion package, but that's over 10 years, which sort of got lost in the discussion. Only 70 of it uh, is for chips. Most of it's for science grants. And Congress actually looks through the appropriations process every year. And if it, if it was too much money, uh, it can cut the money in the appropriations bills or it can increase it. So again, this is, uh, this was very, that portion was extremely bipartisan, had been worked on 
by members of both parties and uh, had, had mostly already passed. This was just repackaged and put in this bill. So, again, I think that was an important bill for America's economic security and national security going forward, and I supported it. The last bill, the one you've heard the most about, is the so-called reconciliation bill. This is a situation where the Senate invokes a process it can use once a fiscal year and uh, uh, eliminates uh, the filibuster. And as long as it deals with the budget, then uh, you can pass things on a straight majority vote, not have to reach the 60 that you normally do. Uh, this bill, uh, uh, which was really a miniature version of the so-called Build Back Better bill that we heard about last year, literally raises taxes by hundreds of billions of dollars, raises spending by hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, and implements a vast climate change agenda, which we can debate the merits of. But the two big problems to me were, number one, the tax increases. Uh, we're, we're either in a recession or going into one now. You don't raise taxes in a situation like that. Uh, no, n neither party's ever done it. They think it's a bad idea. And, of course, uh, the American Rescue Plan, which was passed under reconciliation last year, actually kicked off the current inflation surge that we have right now. Now, if you read the title of this bill, it says, well, it's, it's an anti-inflation bill. It's nothing of the sort. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office has said, actually, it will make inflation slightly worse, not better. There's other private studies out there. This is simply politics. Uh, and this is a bill that was negotiated. It didn't go through any committee in either the Senate or the House in its written form. Uh, it was negotiated by two senators in a back room, Manchin and uh, uh, Senator Sh Schumer. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's just an outrageous process. Uh, now, it's not only the things in Congress that have been eventful, things out of Congress have been eventful. Obviously, uh, the war in Ukraine continues to grind on. Ukrainians, uh, frankly, giving as good as they get um, with considerable support from not just the United States, but all of Europe. NATO has, has kicked in heavily. Um, then, of course, there is uh, the whole issue of congressional visits to China, which has sort of roiled the waters. Uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi went there uh, unannounced, but uh, until she arrived, uh, the Chinese, you know, I would say overreacted. They're shooting missiles over Taiwanese airspace and conducting military drills. There's now been a second congressional trip since then. Uh, I support both those trips, by the way. While I don't agree with uh, Speaker Pelosi on a lot of issues, it's uh, appropriate for any member of Congress to visit Taiwan. This is done very frequently. Uh, American uh, members of Congress of both parties travel uh, sometimes to dangerous areas. It's always their right to do so. Uh, and uh, we certainly shouldn't be bullied uh, by the Chinese. So I think uh, making the visits and going ahead with them was the right thing to do. Let me talk now about the most recent thing that's roiling everything, certainly roiling our office. We've gotten plenty of calls about it. And that's the FBI's uh, unprecedented uh, raid of uh, former President Trump's uh, uh, Mar-a-Lago, uh, you know, compound is where he lives. Um, I think like this honestly has ever happened in American history before. We've never searched the home of a former president. Uh, we don't really know a lot about this right now. Uh, that is, uh, the Justice Department, since it was raid, obviously didn't announce it was coming. Uh, they just showed up, uh, FBI and uh, we found out three days later, uh, Attorney General uh, Garland held a press conference uh, to discuss it. He was 45 minutes late to the press conference. Uh, then he didn't take any questions. He just simply said, I approved this, and I did it for very good reason, but he didn't tell us what the reasons were and didn't answer any questions. Uh, you know, that's going to create enormous controversy, and it has, and frankly, some danger. And I, I would just uh, tell everybody, please, no matter where you are in the issue, no matter how mad you are, please don't do anything untoward. We did have some gentleman that, uh, you know, I don't know the exact circumstances, but he went to an FBI office armed. That's not a smart thing to do. The people there are armed, too, and they know what they're doing, and he ended up getting killed. Uh, we, we cannot have things like that. We cannot have people dis disobeying um, 
the law and and uh, subjecting law enforcement officers to violence. That's just not appropriate and dangerous for all concerned. Uh, what we do know, uh, the, the Justice Department has said they will release the warrant, and uh, that doesn't really tell you very much. What you really want is the affidavit underneath that, which tells you, uh, okay, what are they looking for? We don't really know that yet. We don't know if this is just classified information. In other words, it's a search for records that should belong in the National Archives. Uh, we don't know if there's a criminal case here underway. Uh, the fact that they also took the phone of a congressman uh, Scott Perry from Pennsylvania, about the same time that Scott was uh, involved in uh, January 6th in the sense of, of communicating a lot to the White House at that time. Um, you know, maybe these things are linked. Maybe they're not. We just simply don't know. I issued a statement that uh, called on uh, the Attorney General and the FBI to come before Congress. We have committees of jurisdiction and just answer questions. Tell us what you're looking for. Tell us why you're looking for it. Tell us what you know. Now, some people would argue, well, you can't do that publicly. Well, that's an interesting debate to have, but you don't have to do it publicly. You could go to the intelligence committees. Uh, indeed, uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee, which is uh, chaired by uh, Senator Warner of, of Virginia and co-chaired by uh, uh, Senator Rubio of Florida, has sent a joint letter. Uh, asking the Justice Department to do that. Hey, you know, we can we can do this in secret, but come in, show us what you've got, tell us why you've done this. Uh, I, I suspect the House Intelligence Committee, uh, I've, I've certainly seen a number of members of it. I don't know if there's been a joint letter by the two leaders, uh, of the, the chair and the ranking member, but again, that's an appropriate thing to do. Go explain to somebody why you've done something that's never been done before, in American history. And I'm, I'm sorry, just saying trust me is not enough. I mean, that's not going to satisfy people that are prepared to, to believe the worst. We've had enough instances, you know, we didn't raid Hillary Clinton's home at uh, Chapel in New York. Uh, we haven't raided Hunter Biden's home. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen raids before of other members of Congress uh, that cost them their elections, but then nothing was done. Uh, uh, they were never charged with anything. I think of Kurt Weldon of Pennsylvania. I think of John Doolittle of California. I think of the late Ted Stevens, who did lose his election. Uh, and then later, the Justice Department, uh, you know, frankly, apologized to him, said they'd done the wrong thing. Uh, and they should have never done it, should have never done it close to election. The fact, again, that this is close to an election, I think, stokes concerns on all sides. And, uh, you know, again, I, without seeing more information than I've seen, um, I will say this. I mean, whatever was there has been sitting there for 18 months. Uh, and uh, it's not like it's, you know, out in the open. It's under in a compound guarded by secret service agents 24 hours a day. Not stuff that was being transmitted over the Internet where it could be intercepted. It's just hard for me to believe there was much there that was in any immediate danger. But again, to be fair, I don't know. And I don't think anybody else does either right now. So the best thing to do to lower the temperature on this would be for the Justice Department and the FBI to go before Congress, either publicly or for some reason they can't do that, uh, go before the intelligence committees of both bodies and start answering questions. Otherwise, this is the sort of thing that is going to be wild and speculative, and people are going to try and use uh, uh, politically uh, to inflame uh, the situation. That's not to anybody's advantage. That's not good for the country. It's certainly not good for the confidence that uh, uh, you know anybody has in DOJ and FBI. It's just it's time to do a little bit, a lot more explaining as to why you did something that hasn't happened in 240 odd years of American history before. I think. When you do that, the burden of proof is on you. And showing up three days after the fact at a press conference where you don't answer any questions and you just say, I did it, and trust me, I'm sorry. Uh, that's just not sufficient. So in this case, we're going to have to have more information. But I do urge this in conclusion. Don't draw conclusions yourself until you get more information. Uh, but, again, there needs to be a process whereby both the American people uh, and certainly uh, the Congress can be informed of what's happening and a, 
assured that things are moving according to law. Just, uh, again, uh, an after-the-fact press conference where you answer no questions is not going to be sufficient. Uh, so with that, uh, operator, I went on longer than I intended to, but we're getting a lot of questions about this, and I wanted to delve into it. Uh, be happy, uh, Melissa, now to uh, turn it over to you, and uh, you can advise our audience how they can proceed, and we'll start answering questions. Thank you for that, Congressman. And just a reminder to participants, if you'd like the chance to Melissa, ask you are breaking up questions. on my phone. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I mean, every now and then there's all of a sudden a gap. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, well, just a reminder to participants, if you'd like the chance to ask Congressman Cole a question, please press star three on your telephone. First, we will go live with James from Ada. Hi, James. It's Tom Cole. How are you? Hey, wonderful. How are you? I always enjoy these so much, and uh, it's a great way to stay informed. Uh, I'm kind of concerned that we have, uh, what is it, 87 dollars in the U.S. agents being appropriated, huh. and uh, that's 30,000, that's almost 30,000 more than the entire Navy Reserve that some of our reserve students do. I mean, uh, and these people are, are going to, and many of them, if not all of them, the criminal will be armed because people don't realize that the IRS also has a, uh, a group for, uh, for, for taking down people who, who they want to raise and everything, no differently than the uh, FBI. So, uh, is this a, is this a bit concerning? It sounds almost like a declaration of war. Well, yeah. I'm sorry, you're not always clear in this. Again, I didn't. I, I certainly got the thrust on the IRS agents, but your the quality of the transmission, for whatever reason, probably not your fault, was not as good as I'd like. So, but let me try and respond. First of all, I'm glad you brought that up. I should have brought that up when I was talking about this reconciliation bill. Uh, it's an unprecedented expansion of the IRS. And we're increasing the budget by 600 uh, percent. You know, that's we're almost doubling the size of the IRS. And anybody that thinks that there's not going to be a lot more audits because of this, I think it's just being naive. Fifty six percent of the audits that the IRS performs are on people that make less than seventy five thousand dollars a year. That's over half. So it's not like these folks just focus on uh, the most uh, 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 wealthy of taxpayers. And a lot of these things, honestly, are going to be looking at farms and small businesses where there's pass-through income that historically, uh, it's, it's difficult to judge. You know, again, I've, I've been audited once by the IRS. Um, it, it was not a fun experience, although it ended up pretty good for me. I actually got a big refund. I'd been overpaying. Uh, they thought they saw something. So it's not always bad. But Again, this is an amazing expansion of government. It basically is that we don't think the American people are paying enough taxes. And it's not just going to be focused on billionaires and millionaires. It's going to be focused uh, a lot on the average American because it is now. Um, so, again, that was just another one of the reasons I voted no on the legislation. Uh, you can go to my website, see my speech on the floor against it or my arguments in the Rules Committee against it. Uh, but every other member of the Oklahoma delegation voted no, too. I mean, there wasn't a crack uh, amongst our members in either the House or the Senate. We all think this is an outrageous process. We all think this is a bad product. We all think it's going to make inflation worse, not better. Uh, we all think it's going to slow economic growth at a time that's already beginning to slow down. And again, uh, there is a part of this that's going to be a tremendous overreach by the government in the personal affairs of the average American. So it's a bad bill. It's a very bad bill. Uh, and again, uh, sorry that uh, we couldn't defeat it. We came within one vote in the Senate. We came within just a few votes in the House, but we didn't get a single Democrat in either the Senate or the House that voted with us on this bill. Uh, and that was a disappointment. I thought we'd get two or three in the House, but we didn't. And uh, so this was a party line fight. It was rammed through on a party line basis. And if you like the legislation, you ought to give the Democrats the credit. If you don't, uh, frankly, they certainly deserve the blame. All right. And just a reminder for participants, if you'd like to ask the Congressman Cole a question, please press star three on your telephone. 
Next, we will go live with Tommy from Moore. Tommy? Hey, Tommy. It's Tom, from also from Moore. Well, hello, Mr. Tom. How are you today, sir? I'm doing good, thank you. You know, Tom, what concerns me, uh, you know, with the, all the other issues we've talked about is a great concern to me also, but what the thing that just I don't understand is we're being invaded from the south at our southern border, you know, and it it's nothing... There's nothing about it that is lawful that goes against everything in our Constitution of being invaded, you know, and it, is it not, has the President broken his oath of office for not defending our country from from what's going on with the invasion that we're getting from the southern border? And why can't we put more pressure on the President or the Department of Homeland Security to get it stopped? Well, first of all, uh, you know, I wouldn't say he's breaking his oath, but he's certainly ignoring his responsibility. Uh, look, this, this is, we didn't have this until he became president. He started changing things from day one, and it clearly hasn't worked. I mean, first the president said, well, this will be temporary, it'll be transitory, it's going to slow down. It hasn't slowed down. It's gotten worse. And it's not just a question of people coming across illegally, which is wrong and bad in and of itself, but the amount of fentanyl. Uh, and dr illegal drugs coming across the border, and we have record numbers of Americans dying of overdoses right now, is breathtaking. So is the human trafficking. It usually involves young women, you know, usually for sexual exploitation. Uh, it's just simply outrageous, and it fuels, frankly, crime in Mexico. You're empowering the cartels. We're like giving them billions of dollars because they charge these people to get to the border. It's not the Mexican government that, that controls the the border on their side of the border anymore. It's cartels. Uh, so I think this is an incredible failure. There's no new idea. If we need 87,000 something new border agents would be good. Uh, that'd be something that could have make an immediate difference. I feel sorry for the Border Patrol. Uh, these are men and women that work really hard and are in dangerous situations all the time. They are made it very clear they're not happy with the leadership they're getting in this administration. They're not happy with the president's policies. They're being harassed and turned into, you know, uh, you know babysitters and, and, and uh, kind of expediters of this incredible illegal, uh, you know, exodus into the United States. And again, this is not something that was happening before Joe Biden was president. So this is one that I hope Americans take into account. We pressure. We actually push for more money for the border Patrol. I think Republicans fought pretty hard to protect and to side with the men and women that are doing a tough job. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, the president is the president. He runs the executive branch. The Democrats have the majority in the Senate and the House. Uh, and they just ignore the problem. They were down there every other day when President Trump was in office uh, complaining about the treatment of migrants on the border. You don't see any Democrats at the border these days. I mean, uh, Vice President Harris has been there once. Uh, I don't know of any Democrat. I'm sure some have, but I mean, Democratic members don't go to the border, except the few that are on the border, and some of them are complaining pretty loud. Uh, you know, uh, Republicans actually just <clears throat> won a, a House seat, a border seat, an 84% Hispanic seat. They've never had a Republican representative in 150 years. Now has a Mexican-born Republican woman whose husband's a border agency, and she ran against what Joe Biden and the Democrats are doing on the border. So, uh, again, we can make changes uh, if we change the political leadership, but if the American people turn a blind eye to this uh, and, and don't hold the folks accountable, and this is very much a Biden-created uh, border crisis, um, then we won't see change. Because the administration, has literally, you, you would think after watching a failure this epic in scope, they would submit a budget that asks for more money for Homeland Security, more agents, additional authorities. Instead, they, they don't do that, and they continue giving up authorities like the so-called Title 42 that they had, which allowed us to stop people that had not been vaccinated that were coming in the country and potentially might have COVID. Uh, again, your, your points are all well made. 
uh, we're fighting as hard. We put as much publicity as we can. You've seen Republican officials in Texas itself, Governor Abbott, uh, you know, try to uh, uh, raise the awareness of this, uh, you know, and I think we'll continue that. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, we, we need a change in personnel in the White House, in my view, and we need a Congress that wants to defend the borders, not turn a blind eye as people come across uh, illegally and as the amount of drugs and human trafficking grow exponentially. Thank you, Congressman. And just a reminder to participants, if you would like the chance to ask Congressman Cole a question, please star three on your telephone. Again, to ask Congressman Cole a question, please press star three on your telephone. Next, we will go to Todd from Duncan. Todd? Hey, Todd, this is Tom Cole, how are you? Good, how are you doing, sir? Doing good, thank uh, you. I was calling about Social Security mm -hmm. in large because I know the budget's gonna be out here in a couple of years and I'm on disability insurance uh, through the government, and that's going to go away too. What is Congress doing anything about that, or are they just? It's not doing enough. Spend a, now, I, I don't think spending I'm money sorry, on ahead. stuff that we don't need. They're just spend wisely. Well, they spend money we don't need. They're spending money where we don't need it, and not spend money where we do need it. Well, I, okay. I certainly agree with that thank assessment. You. Uh, thank you. Uh, look, Social Security, both disability. Uh, Social Security disability and the regular system are adequately funded until about 2033. That's not very far from now, but it's a decade away. So uh, Congress, uh, yeah, I actually have a bill that uh, would would set up a convention or a commission to look at Social Security. This is exactly what Ronald Reagan did and Tip O'Neill and Howard Baker back when they saved the system, when it was close to going bankrupt in 83. Um, Propose some reforms, and uh, and then uh, you know uh, submit it to Congress. Congress would have to vote up or down on it. But we need to strengthen the system. I don't think Social Security is going away. It's a very popular program. It has about a 90% approval rate. Um, senior Americans uh, uh, actually have the lowest poverty rate of any group, partly because of Social Security and Medicare. Uh, you know, you point out an important thing. This is an insurance program, not just a retirement program. It's, it is disability assurance. Um, you know, all of us can have bad circumstances in life, either through injury or a problem or the premature, uh, premature death of a guardian. Uh, most people don't know this, but Paul Ryan, former Speaker of the House, father died when he was 16. Social Security uh, insurance helped his mom get through and keep the family together and food on the table. And, uh, you know, and they, they went on from there. So again, it's an important program. I have legislation that is bipartisan in nature. We've had democratic support in the past. We're going to keep working on it. Uh, certainly not going to let it disappear, but the sooner we deal with it, the cheaper it will be, the less expensive it will be. And, uh, we should, again, you know, do what Ronald Reagan did back in the eighties, they made some very modest reforms, didn't affect anybody on Social Security, didn't affect anybody close to Social Security, um, actually slightly raised uh, taxes to make sure there was enough income. The biggest challenge to Social Security right now is simply people are living a lot longer than they used to. When we first passed Social Security back in the 30s, uh, you got your first check at 65, and the average American lived to 63. Uh, and if you got to 65, most Americans really were gone by the time they were in the 70 or in the early 70s. Uh, now, if you get to 65, you have a 50% chance of getting to 85, and you have about a 25% chance of getting uh, well into your 90s, 93, 94. I always say now that I'm 73, I think this is a very good thing. So I'm not interested in seeing Social Security bankrupted, but we need to reshore it up. We need to make some practical reforms in it. And we need to address its funding, and that may need, that may require some more income into it. I mean, that's what we did before. But, again, doing it sooner rather than later is the right thing to do and not putting off this problem and make, making Americans worry about it. So, again, we've got legislation on it. We'll keep pushing it. But, honestly, we need a president of the United States and no president, Democrat or Republican, 
since George Bush has been interested in dealing with it. The last president that actually proposed having a discussion about Social Security reform uh, was George uh, W. Bush. He did that in 2005. Republicans lost in 2006, and everybody has been afraid of bringing it up since then. But we need to talk about it, focus on it, and get it done. And I'm happy to, to work with my friends on both sides of the aisle to do that. All right. And before we get to our next question, just wanted to remind participants to ask Congressman Cole a question, please press star three on the telephone. And if you'd like to opt in to future ta telephone talent like this, press one. To ask a question, star three, and to opt in, press one. Next, we will go live with Nancy from Lawton. Nancy. Hi, Nancy. It's Tom Cole. Hi, Tom. Nancy Alexander from Lawton, Fort Sill, and I'm a veteran, and I would like to ask, what is new on energy? Because I know you're on that. Well, I'm actually not on any of the committees that deal directly with it, but I certainly care about it. This is, a, as you know, a big energy uh, district. Uh, you know, it depends on which side you look at. On the fossil fuel side, uh, honestly, not much. Uh, uh, Senator Manchin says he got some reforms and permitting additional energy infrastructure, that would be pipeline, the grid, things like that. Uh, but we haven't seen any of those reform, and none of them were in the recent legislation. And honestly, this has been a administration that's largely hostile to uh, fossil fuels. Um, on the uh, climate change issue, there is quite a bit. And uh, again, you can like it or not like it, but tax subsidies to buy electric vehicles, an additional tax on methane, uh, that's, I think, not a good idea, <laughs> quite frankly. It's going to raise the cost of heating and cooling everybody's home. Uh, there's other ways to discourage methane uh, production besides taxing it. Um, and, uh, uh, again, we, we had quite a bit of green energy uh, legislation. There's uh, additional tax subsidies if you choose to, um, you know, put solar panels on your roof, if you choose to uh, improve the, the uh, heating and cooling by changing your windows out or adding a heat pump, there's some things like that. But in terms of actual production, uh, we haven't seen much in that way. This is an administration that honestly has taken uh, a lot of federal land and, and waterways out of production or said we're going to not do that anymore. Uh, it's been a, an administration that... Uh, uh, ended the Keystone Pipeline that would have brought 800,000 barrels of Canadian crude uh, uh, a, a day into the United States. Um, again, it's just it's an administration that's broadly hostile. The president, when the president was running, he said he was going to put uh, oil and gas companies out of business. That doesn't encourage them to invest in additional production very much. Uh, so. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a very unbalanced uh, energy policy. We really ought to be in a – Republicans used to use this phrase, and then President Obama started using it, uh, and all the above. That is, there, there's certainly a place for renewable energy in the United States. I mean, Oklahoma is a very good example. We're number two in the country in the amount of wind power that we have. Uh, over 40 percent of our electricity in Oklahoma – uh, on a day-to-day -day basis provide by wind power. But obviously, we're also a significant producer of oil and natural gas. Other parts of the country, uh, honestly, uh, uh, you know, are, are uh, use more nuclear power. We don't, we don't have any of that here. Uh, there's some things we could do there, both in terms of reducing the regulatory expense and time and you know, opening Yucca Mountain where you could store spent nuclear waste. Uh, that's always a touchy political problem between the two sides. But the reality is I don't think we're doing much to increase production. Uh, we are doing a lot to incentivize conversion uh, from fossil fuels to uh, uh, other forms of energy and, and to subsidize things like electric cars, which are pretty expensive, to be fair and uh, I think are not likely to be a short-term solution to our energy problems. All right, and next we will go to Carson from Blanchard. Carson? Hey, Carson. Hey, thank you so much for calling for your service and uh, fighting for us here in Oklahoma. But I, 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 don't, I don't really want to leave that so 
so-called uh, Inflation Reduction Act bill that just passed. Uh, I think that over half the country is against this, and uh, it, was, it was jammed down on quotes. But my question is, when we do take Congress back, how quick and would you support repealing this bill, amending it, or defunding <laughs> it, and how quick can it be done? Because I, 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 I would support budget. all uh, all of the above. I mean, uh, I'd repeal it uh, as quickly as I could. Uh, I certainly will try to do what we can to defund it, uh, insofar as it depends on the appropriations process. Uh, it, it's just it's a really bad piece of legislation. Now, if we retake the House, we can stop them from doing things, and we can pass bills and put them in the Senate. But remember. Uh, Joe Biden's still the president of the United States. He can still sustain a veto. Uh, the Senate uh, most of the time operates, uh, uh, you know, where, where you have the uh, uh, so-called filibuster where it takes 60 votes. We can pass a reconciliation package, though, just like the Democrats have, uh, and put it over there. But to actually get it to the president's desk, we're going to need to take the, the uh, uh, Senate in the elections, too. And we might. Uh, I shouldn't say we, I should say Republicans might, but that's going to be tougher. It's tougher simply because, uh, you know, the Senate seats that are up uh, tend to lay in in either contested or Democratic territory. And the the map, as you will, gets much better for us uh, as Republicans in 2024 and 2026. So uh, I'm not saying we can't do it because we clearly can, uh, but it's harder. The House is more likely to switch, and I can assure you, uh, we'll be working to undo this bill as quickly as we can. Remember, every single Republican in both houses voted against this bill. Uh, you know, so when you put up every vote you got uh, from your most moderate to your most conservative, um, it shows there's a broad consensus within Republican ranks where this legislation is concerned. Uh, but we we got to have some members that more members that think the way we do and are less intimidated uh, by the Biden administration and and the Democratic leadership in the House and the Senate. And we've got to have Democrats, you know, that have a little more backbone. I mean, uh, honestly, you know, Joe Manchin uh, brought us the American Rescue Plan uh, that that kicked off inflation, and now he agreed to this bill, um, much to the surprise of a lot of people. Uh, I'd say anybody surprised hadn't followed his record over the years. Look, he, he, I, and I say this with no disrespect. He's a Democrat, and so don't be surprised uh, that he he will be likely in the end to cut a deal with the Democratic leadership and get something done. And this is what he, you know, this is where we ended up because we lost two Senate races in Georgia. If we'd have won either one of those Senate seats, this legislation would never have occurred. Elections really do matter. Who wins and loses really does make a difference. And Congress is now the most narrowly divided it's been since 1884. We've never seen a situation quite like this in living memory where you had a 50-50 United States Senate and literally a matter of four votes difference on any given vote if the Republicans stayed united and the Democrats, if four of them came over and joined us, we'd win the vote on the floor. Uh, That's a very unusual situation, and uh, uh, hopefully the elections will... Uh, make it a little bit uh, clear and, and honestly uh, give people with your point of view, my point of view, more power and influence in the process. All right. And next we will go to Katie from, sorry, Katie from Frederick. Frederick. Hi, Katie. Hello, Tom. Hey, Katie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm really glad to talk to you. I'm behind you all the way. I just wanted to give everybody uh, kudos on the VA. We get, you know, a lot of bashing on those guys. I have a brother that uh, served in Korea, and he's been disabled many years. And every big VA center I have gone to him with, they just bombard him with services, services. They do everything for him. And when I've been at this the big VA centers, they've been mostly in the west and south, I guess. Um, I ask them, why is he getting all this stuff? All I hear is people that can't get services, can't get services. 
and they didn't show me names, but they showed me the sheets. And those the guys up there are 99% non-compliant. In other words, they don't show up for medicine. They don't show up for appointments. My brother even gets massages from the VA because nobody else wants them. He just gets in a little taxi and goes to the VA and spends the day like it's a spa because nobody else is coming. But I just wanted to, if you have relatives and friends who are upset with the VA, make sure that they're going for their appointments. Well, and that's that, all that I have a, to say, except that well, I want to drill in Oklahoma and Texas. <laughs> so do I, and and our companies are. Uh, but I want to go back to your comment on the VA just quickly, and uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Look, my dad was a career master sergeant in the United States Air Force, and sadly, uh, just after uh, he retired, actually probably before we now know, he, he contracted uh, – Alzheimer's, and so the last 11 years, of uh, the last 12 years, he was in VA centers in Ardmore and Norman, uh, and didn't know any of us the last 11 years. He got fantastic service. I, I mean, I couldn't be prouder of the people in Ardmore and Norman and the care that they gave. I have a, a brother who has a, a he's a Vietnam era vet and has a disability connected with his service. He's gotten great help too. Um, this is something uh, the United States actually does better than any place else in the world. We don't spend more than any other country in the world on veterans. We spend more than every other country in the world combined uh, on care and services for veterans. And that's because the American people want to do that. Uh, they appreciate the men and women that sacrificed for them, and they're intended on or determined to give them uh, great care. And that's why I mentioned early on in my remarks about Hey, the the uh, program to deal with uh, toxic uh, burn pits was bipartisan. It was, you know, both both parties worked on that. And we have increased veterans' services and spending under every president uh, during my time in Congress. Uh, you know, we, we basically doubled them under Bush. We doubled them again under Obama. We certainly increased them. We actually got the best ratings for the VA under Trump that we've ever gotten. And I'm not being critical of the current VA. I just don't know if they've gotten the same high ratings, but I, I think they have. Uh, and again, uh, we certainly have problems and issues. We maintain a very robust uh, effort here to help our veterans. This is a big veterans district, but uh, thank you for giving those men and women that work there uh, a shout out because a lot of them work very hard. They care very much about the men and women they're trying to serve and Certainly, I will tell you, in Congress, this actually tends to be the area the two parties work the best together on. So thank you for uh, uh, giving a shout-out to those folks. All right. And next, we will go to John from Noble. John? Hey, John. It's Tom yeah, Cole. How are you? Hey, Tom. I'm, I'm well. Thank you. I hope you are also. I am. Thanks. Cool. Excellent. Good to know. Uh, I appreciate you doing these town hall meetings. It, it, I don't know of another uh, representative that does as many as regularly as you do. Well, thank you. We think it's important. Well, good deal. It, it is for us. Um, I wanted to say I, I don't understand where the Democrats are coming from um, and and how they can do these things that they do. Uh, they've gutted the energy industry. Uh, they've gutted the border. They, they refuse to support uh, energy exploration. They, they uh, seem to be uh, doing to death the farm industry. I, I, I don't understand the, the methane rules and the taking of, of, of croplands out of production when we need those croplands uh, now. Uh, and with uh, things like the potato problem that they're having in the Pacific Northwest and and the wheat problems that, that Texas is having, the, all the different crops that are not doing so well. Um, and the Democrats just don't seem to be concerned with anything but, but accruing more power to themselves. And I just don't understand uh, where, where they're coming from. Surely they must know that, that they're in trouble um, in this coming election season. Uh, I don't see how they could not know. And 
to be so tone deaf, uh, seems to me that they're running a great risk of, of angering more people and, and getting uh, or losing even more seats than, than we already know they will. Uh, I, I just don't get their attitude. Well, you know, again, people believe in things and fight for them, uh, and that's their right. That's the way our system works. I don't have any objection to that, but I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, just go through the things you listed. The, the failure on the border is just breathtaking. There's no way you can look at that and see the number of people coming across illegally rising by four or five hundred percent on a monthly basis. I mean, things didn't just go a little wrong. They are totally, and they've they've done nothing new. Uh, you know, they just continued down the same road. I feel the same thing about energy production. I mean. First, you run for president saying you're going to put these people out of business, and then you're mad when the price of oil and gas goes up because people aren't exploring and producing as much as you would like. Uh, and you do everything in the world to make their life more difficult. You vilify them. You discourage investment in their industry. You don't approve pipelines. Uh, well, no wonder. And yet production is up. I mean, people are working really hard to to try and give Americans – as expensive as it is, we still have the most reasonably priced energy of any anybody in the world. I mean, go try and and uh, you know buy a gallon of gas in Europe or heat and cool your home, and that's an advanced part of the world. That's not, you know we're not talking about uh, some barbaric place. We're talking about rich uh, place, but but their, their prices are so much beyond ours, it's unbelievable. So uh, you know we're just going to keep working. Um, We'll see what happens in the elections. I've been surprised by election before, both in a positive ways and negative ways. But it is important people vote if they've got concerns one way or the other. I mean, I, I always tell people, you know, this, this country still does work. So please go out and voice your opinion. Talk to your friends and neighbors and, and go vote. And uh, I have to tell you, I'm very proud of our delegation in Oklahoma because it pretty consistently is on the right side of the issues uh, that you raised. And, um, uh, you know, it, it, I think it reflects uh, opinion broadly here in Oklahoma. And uh, I think it tends to be common sense, pro-energy, pro-border security, pro-national defense, uh, pretty conservative uh, uh, values. That, that's, again, that's who we are. That's how our delegation votes. And I, uh, we're going to keep working at it. But it would certainly help if we could get some more friends from other parts of the country. Now, I am proud that, you know, you know we added a new member um, in the last election, an election that Republicans lost at the presidential level. We're supposed to lose congressionally. We actually picked up House seats. One of them was my friend to the north, Stephanie Bice, in uh, the in the 5th District of Oklahoma, um, and she's off to a great start in Congress. So uh, I think Oklahoma is punching above its weight. Uh, you know, we've got a very important Senate race. I'm, I'm not involved in that race in terms of endorsing candidates, but, you know, come the fall, we'll have a Republican and Democratic nominee. I'll certainly be supporting the Republican, uh, and hopefully we'll we'll continue to do the right things. But, again, the right things only happen when people show up and vote, and hopefully they will. All right, and next we will go to Don. Ardmore. Don? Hey, Don. This is Tom Cole. Thank How you. are you? I'm doing fine, Tom. How are we doing I was to... Just, uh, how are we going to I was in Ardmore today, by the way. I, I'm well, sorry. I, I interrupted you. Yeah, I did. I was. I had uh, lunch with a couple of your state legislators and uh, uh, with Admiral Hull, who runs the museum there and has helped so much on the veteran, new veteran uh, cemetery you guys have coming in. So it's pretty, it was a pretty good trip. Anyway, you you asked the question. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, how are we going to protect our elections from election fraud? There is no way uh, that uh, they're going to convince me that uh, that they Biden won the 2020 election fairly. Uh, they uh, won't. Uh, they won't. They won't do a forensic audit to to squash the division in America. If they just did that, they could shut people up like me who think there was election fraud. But they won't do it. Well, they'll do everything you know, but do that. It, it depends on the state. Uh, you know, first of all, I want to start out here uh, and give our, uh, you know, state election board secretary and state election board high marks. I think they do a fantastic job. We have very seldom have contested election here, 
and you know these optical scanners that they use where you have both the paper ballot backup and whatever have been very successful so you, you can have a great deal of confidence here in terms of other places the best thing congress did i think was prevent what's called hr1 which are a lot of uh, voting quote unquote reforms the democrats wanted to do if you like the way california votes uh, that would have become a nationwide process. And uh, Congress stopped that. They passed it through the House, but our friends in the Senate, including both our senators, uh, made sure it didn't happen. Uh, and so I, I feel good about that. Uh, remember, in terms of election integrity, it really gets down to the issue of every state. Uh, you know, what the Democrats wanted to do in H.R. 1 was basically have a national election system. Constitution is pretty clear about this. Every state, as long as you don't violate, you know, violate somebody's civil rights, you can't keep people from voting, uh, you know, on the basis of race or ethnicity or gender or what have you. But the point is, the states design their election systems, uh, and uh, you know, ours honestly is pretty good. Uh, I think uh, other states, uh, again, I would see it differently, but. It's not up to me to tell people in California how to vote. So I think the most important thing is just to go participate. Uh, And remember, when you do go, uh, the people that you're talking to are your friends and your neighbors. Those volunteers there at the election board, and that's what they are. They get a very modest sum of money to go down and do it. Uh, But um, they are friends and neighbors. They're people you see at your church. They're people you see at the Rotary Club. They're there are the folks there, and they're the front line of defense in the system. So, uh, again, I'll, I think if, if everybody turns out, we'll be just fine from our standpoint. And, again, I have great confidence in our system here in Oklahoma. And I think we have time for one final question. So we will go to Betty from Midwest City. Betty? Hey, Betty. Yes. How are you? I'm well. How about you? Great, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm concerned a bit. We have all these disasters all over, fires here, the border, everywhere. There's there's things that are happening. And I, I, I've often wondered if that's a Trojan horse to keep us from knowing about people buying land near our bases or buying our land that's a food supply. Is there any way that can be stopped? In, in terms of? Uh, you know, purchasing land, yeah, there are things we can do. Uh, Now, the biggest purchasers of land are still people like Britain and Denmark that are not here for nefarious purposes. They're just making investments. But there are legitimate concerns about China uh, or things like that. And and anything near a base, uh, you know, federal authorities can raise legitimate questions about that. Uh, We do things like this, everything from yeah, well, honestly, we do it with turbine power and, and uh, you know, we want to make sure, uh, or wind power, that we don't have things that block our access. So there are some things we can do. Uh, I still think, uh, on balance, though, the, the best thing is just to maintain a strong defense. Uh, your state government has a lot of authority over, you know, who can buy and hold land. So does your local government. So I'd voice my concerns there, uh, but uh, I don't think information is deliberately being put into the domain to distract you, in other words, to keep your mind off something. I, d- I actually met with a group of uh, newspaper editors and publishers today, and we talked a lot about um, some of the problems with inaccurate information over the Internet or people manipulating uh information, not being held to the same standards you'd hold your local newspaper to. Uh, I do worry about that. There are a lot of things said and done on the Internet, sometimes by foreign powers. I mean, we do know uh, people try to uh, run misinformation campaigns. So uh, I would just tell you, be skeptical. I would tend to, uh, you know, make sure you read multiple sources of information. But I think uh, the, the problem is not to distract from things like land purchases. It's just to divide and inflame uh, the population of the United States. And at the end of the day, we, we have differences with one another. We have different political parties. We have different points of view philosophically. Uh, but the American people are an awfully good and decent people. 
Our institutions have served us very well for 240-odd years. We're the freest country in the world. I often say, well, I'm concerned about our immigration problem. I'd be more concerned if everybody wanted to leave and nobody wanted to come. Uh, no, nobody's moving into China unless you're from North Korea. Uh, and nobody's moving into Russia. You know, people want to come here for a reason, and the reason uh, is it's the freest country in the world with the most opportunity and the most security. Um, so America's still a pretty good place, uh, but we have to do our part uh, to do it. And, and doing our part means everything from, you know, doing your civic duty, go out and vote, go out and participate, to to remembering how lucky we are, supporting the men and women that defend us, support the police that protect us, uh, and just being a good citizen. And um, if we do the, those basic things, uh, we're going to get through any challenge that we have. Again, America's, uh, what's the old saying? You can go broke betting against the United States of America. I still believe that. It's still the greatest country in the world, the freest country in the world, and the one that I think ultimately will prevail, uh, you know, long term in, in terms of its vision and its values. So um, thank you guys for participating. And uh but again, I want to end on an upbeat and optimistic note. God bless America. Thank you, Congressman. And now we are in the near the end of our telephone town hall. And I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to all of your questions, but you'll have the opportunity to leave a message and receive a call back from our office after Congressman Cole provides some final words. Congressman? Well, thank you, Melissa. And again, thank all of you that took the time to... Uh, uh, listen, thank all of you that took time to ask questions. For those of you that weren't able to make it in the queue, we apologize for that, but we'll, if you'll leave your question, we'll try and, and and get back with you. I would also urge you, again, just and it doesn't matter to me what party you're in, but please, we're 80-odd days out from the election. You've got primaries coming up here a week from Tuesday in Oklahoma, runoff elections. Just go make your voice heard. Uh, go cast your vote and uh, participate in the process, and voice your opinions. And, uh, again, uh, I think our people care very deeply about what you think, and uh, not not just uh, our delegation that goes to Washington, D.C. I think we've got very good people at the state and local level here in Oklahoma, and you have very good choices in front of you, so please take the time to do that. Let me just end with this. Uh, a lot of times people will... Uh, voice things to divide us. It's okay to have strong opinions. That's that's pretty typical of the country. Uh, but please don't give in to conspiracy theories. Don't engage in violent activity. Uh, I know nobody on this call would do something like that. Uh, but it's very important. And again, uh, remember the men and women uh, in uniform, whether it's blue that are out there every single day or firefighters that respond to every single emergency and disaster, uh, or God bless the American military that stands between us and those that would do us harm. Um, and just give them your support and your confidence, and uh, uh, we will get through our challenges together. But it would help a lot if you vote and uh, you, you express your opinion. That's the best way is just to participate in the system and uh, make sure that your views and your values are heard. 